Hi, hello there. Welcome to Software Engineering Principles, the first topic on data structures and algorithms. At the end of this video lecture, you should be able to learn about software engineering principles, discover what an algorithm is, and explore problem solving techniques. Become aware of the structure design and object oriented design programming methodologies. Let's start with the first section of this video lecture. On the first section, we will be talking about the software life cycle. Now, what is a software life cycle? A program goes through many phases from the time it is first conceived until the time it is retired, called the life cycle of a program. The three fundamental stages through which a program goes are development, use and maintenance usually a program is initially conceived by a software developer because a customer has some problem that needs to be solved and the customer is willing to pay money to have it solved the new program is created in the software development stage once the program is considered complete it is released for the user to use once users start using the program they most certainly discover problems or have suggestions to improve it. The problems and or ideas for improvements are conveyed to the software developer and the program goes through the maintenance phase. When a program is considered too expensive to maintain, the developer might decide to retire the program and no new version of the program will be released. The software development phase is the first and perhaps most important phase of the software life cycle. A program that is well developed will be easy and less expensive to maintain. Now let's talk about the software development phase. Software engineers typically break the software development process into the following four phases here. So you've got analysis, design, implementation, testing, and debugging. Now let's start with analysis phase. Analysis is analyzing the problem. This is the first and most important step. This step requires you to do the following. First, you need to thoroughly understand the problem. Understand the problem requirements. Requirements can include whether the program requires interaction with a user, whether it manipulates data, whether it produces output and what the output looks like. If the problem is complex, divide the problem into subproblems. Analyze each subproblem and understand each subproblem's requirements. The next phase is design. So after you carefully analyze the problem, the next step is to design an algorithm to solve the problem. If you broke the problem into subproblems, you need to design an algorithm for each subproblem. When we talk about algorithm, okay, so an algorithm is a step by step problem solving process in which a solution is arrived at a finite amount of time. Next would be structured design. So dividing a problem into smaller subproblems is called structured design. The structured design approach is also known as the top-down design, stepwise refinement, and modular programming. In structured design, the problem is divided into smaller problems. Each subproblem is then analyzed, and a solution is obtained to solve the subproblem. The solutions of all the subproblems are then combined to solve the overall problem. This process of implementing a structured design is called structured programming. We also have this OOD or the object oriented design. In OOD or object oriented design, the first step in the problem solving process is to identify the components called objects, which form the basis of the solution and determine how these objects interact with one another. 
For example, suppose you want to write a program that automates the video rental process for a local video store. The two main objects in this problem are the video and the customer. So an object combines data and operations of the data into a single unit. In OOD, the final program is a collection of interacting objects. A programming language that implements OOD is an object-oriented programming or OOP. OOD has the following three basic principles, encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. When we say encapsulation, this is the ability to combine data and operations in a single unit. Inheritance is the ability to create new data types from the existing data types. And polymorphism is the ability to use the same expression to denote different operations. Next phase is implementation. In the implementation phase, you write and compile programming code to implement the classes and functions that were discovered in the design phase. So the final program consists of several functions, each accomplishing a specific goal. So some functions are part of the main program. Others are used to implement various operations on objects. Clearly, functions interact with each other, taking advantage of each other's capabilities. So to use a function, the user needs to know only how to use the function and what the function does. The user should not be concerned with the details of the function. That is how the function was written. Now let us illustrate with the help of the following example here. Suppose that you want to write a function that converts a measurement given in inches into equivalent centimeters. The conversion formula is 1 inch is equal to 2.54 centimeter. All right. So the following functions accomplishes the job. Okay. So for instance, we have here a function named inches to centimeters. Okay. The data type is double. Okay. And then you've got here the parameter inches in double. Okay. Now, if inches is less than zero, then the given measurement must be non-negative. So it should have the notification, the given measurement must be non-negative. Okay, and then this would return a negative 1.0. Else, this would return 2.54 times the value in inches. So the object sir, okay, you've got CERR here. This corresponds to the unbuffered standard error strip. Unlike the object C out, whose output goes to the buffer, the output of SIR is immediately sent to the standard error stream, which is usually the script. If you look at the body of the function, you can recognize that if the value of an inches or inch is less than zero, that is negative. The function returns negative 1.0. Otherwise, the function returns the equivalent length in centimeters. The user of this function does not need to know the specific details of how the algorithm that finds the equivalent length in centimeters is implemented. However, the user must know that in order to get a valid answer, the input must be non-negative. Okay, It should be positive number. If the input to this function is negative number, the program returns negative 1.0. Okay? This information can be provided as part of the documentation of this function using specific statements called preconditions and postconditions. Now, what are the precondition and postconditions? So when you say precondition, this is a statement specifying the conditions that must be true before the function is called. Okay? And when you say post condition, it is a statement specifying what is true after the function call is completed. 
So the precondition and postcondition of the function inches to centimeter can be specified as follows. Okay? So the precondition would be the value of inches must be non-negative. The postcondition, if the value of inches is less than zero, the function returns negative 1.0. Otherwise, the function returns the equivalent length in centimeters. The next phase is testing and debugging. So the term testing refers to testing the correctness of the program. That is, making sure that the program does what it's supposed to do. The term debugging refers to finding and fixing the errors if they exist. So once a function and or algorithm is written, the next step is to verify that it works properly. However, in a large and complex program, errors almost certainly exist. So therefore, to increase the reliability of the program, errors must be discovered and find before the program is released to the user. Okay, so a test case consists of a set of inputs user actions, or other initial conditions, and the expected output. So because a test case can be repeated several times, it must be properly documented. So typically, a program manipulates a large set of data. It is therefore impractical, although possible, to create test cases for all the possible inputs. There are two types of testing. You've got the black box testing, and the white box testing. So in a black box testing, you do not know the internal working of the algorithm or a function. You know only what the function does. Black box testing is based on inputs and outputs. So the next one is white box testing. So white box testing relies on the internal structure and implementation of a function or algorithm. So the objective is to ensure that every part of the function or algorithm is executed at least once.